Hi everyone. One of the most useful tools I've made in my shop is this table stop. I get a fair amount of questions about it whenever it shows up in a video, so it's about time I did a build video. What I really like about this design is that all the adjustments are done with a single knob and no tools are necessary to tighten or loosen anything. You can also angle the stop rod downwards or upwards, which allows you to use this with parts that are being held on the table and not just in a vise. I'll be listing dimensions as I go in both inch and metric, and I'll put a PDF of the print down in the description so you can make the stop yourself. Let's take this thing apart and look at how it's put together. First up, we have the base and the column, which on this one are pressed together. I'm actually making a couple of these, so I'll show you two different ways of doing it, a press fit like this one and a shrink fit as well. If these methods don't work for you, it could easily be done by welding the column in, pinning it, holding it with a set screw, binding it with the soles of your vanquished enemies, whatever works for you. Next up is this aluminum flexure which clamps onto the column. It's a relatively straightforward part to make, but it has some interesting aspects to it that'll let you flex your metalworking muscles, like the split and the radius on the back. Then we have the screw, collar, and knob that work together not only to clamp everything to the column, but also to hold the stop rod. The secret to that is the head on the screw. It's slightly shorter than the collar that goes around it, so when the knob is tightened, it'll draw down against the stop rod to grip it, and also pinch the flexor closed against the column. It's elegantly simple, really. Here's how everything is made. This video will cover all the lathe parts, and I'll do all the milling in the next one. First, the column. This is really simple. It's just a piece of 3 quarter inch or roughly 19 millimeter turned ground and polished rod that's 10 inches or 250 millimeters long. The length is not critical at all. I wouldn't go much longer than that though since you might run into clearance with the head of the mill. It could easily be shorter as well, but I probably wouldn't make it any shorter than about 6 inches or 150 millimeters or you'll definitely lose range of motion. If you have a smaller machine, feel free to scale this all down to a suitable size for you. This part really just needs the ends faced and chamfered. However, I'll be pressing the column into the base, so to make that a little easier, I'm going to relieve the diameter on the end for about a quarter of an inch or six millimeters in length. This isn't much at all diameter wise. I just took a scratch pass right where I touched off. This will help a lot to start the column straight in the bore. If you're ever making or designing a press fit, this is a feature you should allow for if possible. I'll be getting more into the press fit when I make the mating part. For now, let's move on. Next up is the stop rod collar. This is another very simple part. Just face it to 1 inch or 25 millimeters long, then drill a hole through it lengthwise and ream it for a slip fit on the screw head, which is half inch or roughly 13 millimeters in diameter. This part will also be cross-drilled and reamed to fit the stop rod, but I'll show that when we move over to the milling machine. The stop rod itself is also pretty simple. It's made from 3 8 or about 9.5 mm O1 drill rod, mostly because it has a nice ground finish and is accurate in size, but I'll also harden the ends for wear resistance. That may seem like overkill, but parts are going to be bumped into this repeatedly and you don't want the ends to mushroom over time. The length is 12 inches or roughly 300 millimeters overall, and that is certainly not critical in any way. Feel free to modify the design to suit your needs. The ends are each different. One is cut to an angle of 40 degrees included or 20 degrees from the center line, depending on how you want to think about it. I don't want this to be a sharp point because I don't want to scratch parts or have the end be excessively fragile. So I'm rounding the point slightly with a file. The other end will be turned down to eighth of an inch or about three millimeters in diameter, so it'll be unobtrusive to your cutters. The length of this step also isn't critical at all. I made it five eighths of an inch or roughly 16 millimeters long. I'll also give this tip a bit of a crown with the file because it'll almost certainly be angled to the part in use and having a flat end might cause inconsistency. Of course, if another shape would do the job better for you, then do that instead. Shine on you, crazy diamond. This seems like a good time to tell you that I'm giving these stops away. I'm making two of them for the videos, and I also made a pathfinder to get all the jitters out. 
Now I certainly don't need three more of these things lying around, so I'm going to do a giveaway over on Patreon. Three lucky people will be chosen at random from among all of my patrons at 5 p.m. Central Time on April 1st, 2022. If you want a chance to win one of these dudes and help support the channel while you're at it, head over to Patreon and sign up. The link is down in the description. Let's get back to the project. The hardening of the stop rod is done with a propane torch and some canola oil, which I'm using because it's easy to get for most people and has a high flash point, so it's less likely to catch fire and it won't smoke as much as some oils. I've preheated my oil a bit by putting a chunk of hot steel into it. That'll help avoid cracking during the quench due to thermal shock. I have a small rare earth magnet stuck to the side of the can so I can check the metal. I'll heat the part until it's non-magnetic, which means it's above the critical temperature, and then quench it. Make sure to give it a good swirl while you're doing this to avoid having a jacket of bubbles form around your part. That will insulate it and screw up your heat treatment. For this application, I want the tips to be tough, not necessarily hard, so I'm going to temper these back quite a bit, and I'm going to do it by color using my torch. Before I do that, I have to get rid of all the scale that formed when I hardened it, and I'm just doing that with some Scotch-Brite while it runs in the lathe. I'm going to start to heat gently, far away from the tip, and I'll watch as the colors change in the part. I'm looking for a nice dark blue, which would be comparable to a spring temper. That should give plenty of wear resistance. As soon as the color reaches the tip, I'll quench it again. I'll have to be a lot more careful with the skinny tip because that's going to heat up a lot faster. That's why I started on the pointed end. I wanted to get a really good idea of how fast the colors would run. The screw is up next, and this is made from half inch diameter mild steel and threaded to 3 8 16. This could easily be 13 millimeters and an M10 thread, of course. Just adjust your mating parts accordingly. I turned this whole section down to the major diameter of the threads for an inch and 5 eighths or about 41 millimeters. Here are all the specifications for the 3 8 16 thread on the screen. I used a sharpie to mark where the threads would end. The length of the unthreaded section needs to be less than the width of the flexure to ensure that everything clamps down when the knob is tightened. In this case, the flexure is an inch and a half or about 38 millimeters wide. Like I said earlier, the head of the screw needs to be shorter than the stop rod collar. I made this a sixteenth of an inch or about one and a half millimeters shorter than the collar, but this dimension is not critical in the slightest. The knob is two and a half inches in diameter with a smaller section turned down to one inch. That's sixty three and a half millimeters and twenty five millimeters respectively. It's drilled and tapped to match the threads on the screw and I'm going to make the knob a couple of different ways. My original has these cutouts for grip, which I'll show in the next video when I do all the milling. I'm also going to knurl one though, which might be a bit more accessible to some folks out there. I don't want to put a very heavy knurl on it though. That might give it more grip, but I think it would end up tearing up the hand if it's too rough. A tool that injures its operator is not a very good tool. I'm going to test out the knurl and the waste material first to make sure the pattern looks good. I'll start out adjusting the screws so the knurls are just smaller than my diameter. Then I feed in with the cross feed until I feel tension. Zero the dial or the DRO at that spot and turn on the machine. If the pattern doubles up on either wheel, I'll move in a bit more, re-zero the dial and try again. Move to a fresh spot first or the knurls will just follow the pattern you've already created. Once you're satisfied with the way it looks, move over to where your final knurl will be, move to your zero, and get started. I would give yourself plenty of extra room on either side of the finished knurl because the beginning and end of any knurl tends to look a little bit funky. It's best to have that happen in the waste material. In general, I run knurling tools at around 400 RPM or slower. There's a lot of pressure involved, even with a scissor knurling tool like this, so the knurls can heat up quite a lot. Using copious amounts of oil is essential, both to lubricate the knurls and flush away the chips. You're actually displacing metal with this operation, but there are some tiny chips formed that are ripped off the surface of the part by the knurls. I usually use very aggressive feed rates as well, around 15 thousandths per revolution. 
Once the neural is finished, I'll turn everything down to the final dimensions and cut a chamfer at the beginning and end of the neural. That makes everything look nice and clean. I'm going to part this off, but it would be fine to cut it with the saw as well. Either way, you'll want to take a light facing cut to make it look good and get that face down to its final dimension, which is 3 eighths of an inch thick or about nine and a half millimeters. That wraps up all the lathe work and I'll start with all the milling in the next video. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to see me cover in a future video, leave those down in the comments section below. Hit that like and subscribe button if you think I've earned it, and please consider supporting the channel over on Patreon like the wonderful people you can see on your screen right now. You might want to check out these other videos as well. On the right, I have a playlist of all of my project videos. On the top left, I have my most recent video, and on the bottom left, there's a video YouTube thinks you'll enjoy as well. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.